Welcome! I'm delighted to see all of you here today and to welcome you to what promises to be a fascinating panel about higher education. As you know from, if you're alumni and are reading your alumni news, GSE is on the move. And our presence here in Steitler is part of that move. So this summer, actually right before school started, uh, we moved the higher education division and our executive format degree programs back into Steitler Hall. So they're all on the second floor. Um, and we also have access now to the Silverstein Forum where we'll be having the reception right after this meeting. This is an incredibly important step in bringing all of our degree programs back to campus, back to the heart of the social science quad. So we're just thrilled to have higher ed back with us again. Um, when I first came here in 2015, GSE was in six different buildings uh, from 44th and Spruce to 34th and Market. That's not a geography that's particularly conducive to either collaboration or community. So this move back to the center of campus has been huge for us. It's also a part of my vision for creating one GSE with space for all of our students on campus and creating more spaces for 21st century learning. You might notice this <coughs> might not be a 21st century learning space, but our new project for creating a new addition onto our 3700 building that will connect us with Steitler will create new 21st century learning spaces for our students where we can really prepare the 21st century leaders and teachers of tomorrow. So we're very excited about that. It's also going to provide the kind of collaborative spaces for students, both during the week and on weekends for executive students, again, right here in the heart of campus. So stay tuned. We feel like we have a lot of momentum going into this and are very excited about what the future will bring for us. I now want to uh, introduce Laura Perna, who will be moderating the panel today. So Laura is the James S. Reapy Professor of Education here at the Graduate School of Education. And she's both an eminent and extremely busy faculty <laughs> member, as I think many of you know. She's both the chair of the higher ed division here at GSC and the executive director of the Alliance for Higher Education and Democracy, PENAHEAD. But in addition to that, Laura has played an incredible leadership role both across campus and also across the country. She served as the former chair of the Penn Faculty Senate and as president for the, Ameri uh, the Association for the Study of Higher Education, ASH. She's also a fellow of the American Educational Research Association. Among her other accomplishments, Laura is also a distinguished teacher and mentor. She's received the university's Christian and Mary F. Lindbach Foundation Award for Distinguished Teaching, and I hear all the time from her students about how well supported they've been in their experiences with her. <coughs> She's also a, a noted scholar, uh, and her research looks particularly at issues about access and affordability of higher education and federal and state involvement in both pre-college and college education, particularly around promise programs. Currently, her, pro her projects focus on improving equity in higher education in the United States and advancing knowledge of these college promise programs. Her most recent book is Taking It to the Street, The Role of Scholarship in Advocacy in, and Scholarship, and was published in March by the Johns Hopkins University Press. So I feel incredibly fortunate to have Laura as a member of our faculty. Thank you, Laura, for all you do for GSE, for Penn, and for issues related to equity in higher education. And with that, I'll turn it over to you to introduce the panel. And thank you all for coming. It's so fun to see so many 
alumni here, current students and new faces. Really excited to have you be part of the conversation this afternoon. Before we get started with our panel, I want to be sure to introduce some of our faculty who are here. Diane Einan. <laughs> Matt Hartley. <laughs> and Manuel Gonzalez Conte. So, Man for some of you from some of our alumni, Manuel joined us uh, just over a year ago from the University of Georgia. I'm really thrilled to have him here with us in the higher education division. So it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome our esteemed panel. Thank you so very much for making the time to be here today. You have brief bios for each of them in your programs. Um, and these bios just have, they're so, so short. Each of them is so accomplished and has achieved so many things. We could have a whole panel actually just talking about those things. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep the introductions brief so that we can focus on the issues. And so going down the line here, President Linda Oubre, Whittier College. Peter Jordan, President of Tarrant County College South. Guy Darrells, President of Community College of Philadelphia. Julie Wallman, President of Widener University. And Wendell Pritchett, uh, Penn's Provost and Prof Presidential Professor of Law and Education. Executive like member of GSU. Yes, very <laughs> important <laughs> colleague and friend. Okay, so Linda, you've been president of Whittier College since July. Congratulations. Thank you. So you've only had a few months in this role, but I'm curious. What issues did it emerge as most important to address, and then how prepared do you feel to address it? Um, am I on? Yes. Okay. Yeah, on. Um, I've been doing one of those presidential new president road trip. So um, this is the end of a very long trip this week, but I'm really thrilled to be here, but I'm losing my voice. Um, I was thinking about this, um, and it finally hit me in breakfast with Bob Zimsky this morning, who a lot of you know, that I think the biggest surprise and the biggest challenge is how do you create a culture of change um, which is what higher ed needs more than anything, and I think that's what the purpose of the panel is. And it presents itself in so many ways. Um, so I am at an institution, I came from a very large public in the California State University system as a dean of business. I'm also a non-academic, which is why I got my exec doctorate um, in 17. Um, and so I myself represent change. I don't think I appreciated how much me walking in the room and everything I do in my new job signals change. Um, you know, because when you take a new job, you do your analysis. Uh, Bob Zemsky is, is an alum and on the board of trustees. He's my dissertation chair, so I knew a lot about the organization. I'm from the Los Angeles area. I did all my research, but I did not really appreciate me just being me is change. And with change comes resistance. Because that's what we do as humans, uh, is resist change. Even at an institution where, um, from the top down, they know that they have to change. You know, we are, we're not a research one. We're not a top tier liberal arts college. Um, and we are a liberal arts college that literally overnight became the only liberal arts college that's now Hispanic serving institution in the United States and Anapisi. Um, and that means different students. So everything that everyone writes about in higher ed, we've been living in the last five years. Um, but change in higher ed is slow. So we are an institution that now is 69% students of color. And by the way, we do not use the word minority in the state of California. And, and really shouldn't have been for the last 20 years. Um, so we're 69% students of color as of this fall. We're over 50% Latinx. Um, and like the other trends nationally is um, we also are getting more and more Pell recipients. So we're about 35, 36% Pell. And a lot of first generation students. And having been a traditional liberal arts residential college that is the alma mater of Richard Nixon, um, and a former Quaker institution, 
you can understand that you know, the last five years, this change and what that means. So a lot of, if I look at a lot of what I've been doing the last four months and eight days, <laughs> um, has been meeting people. I've spent a lot of time with faculty. I've done one-on-ones now with 60 of the 100 faculty and students and staff. Um, and where it presents itself is when you have a student body that's changed, you know, faculty is hard to change overnight um, because of the tenure system, but they get it because they're, they're the ones who are the front lines with the students every day. So most of the faculty get it. But we have a leadership team um, that I inherited that is all men and only two men of color. Um, and I kid you not, when during my final interview, the Board of Trustees told me they're very proud that the average age of the Board of Trustees has been lowered from 90 to 80. <laughs> and to which I respond, Bob Sinski's on, he's right in the middle. <laughs> um, so, so, so that, so a lot of what I, what I do is, is I work on culture. Um, you know, we, we're not ready. And, you know, I was also hired because my research um, at Penn was on revenue diversification in higher ed. I'm also a former entrepreneur. Um, and so I've done a lot of things when I was at San Francisco State. Um, but higher ed does not have a culture that says be entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, um, we don't have a culture that says take risks. We don't have a culture we talk about student body and making sure the students all know how to work with different cultures. We don't know how to work with different cultures. Um, and so it's, so it's a lot about change and, and fighting the resistance. And so that I'd say is probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. Great, thank you. Did you give me a time limit and I missed it? <laughs> okay. Just like oh. a class? Okay. No. Doing great, thank you. Okay, so far. <laughs> President Woolman, why are university receiving more funding than the twenty eighteen Higher Education Excellence and Diversity Award from Insight into Diversity magazine? This is the third consecutive year that Weiner has received this honor. It's really impressive. Congratulations. We know that one aspect of Weiner's commitment to diversity and inclusion is the Common Ground Initiative. Would you please briefly describe what this is? I'm particularly interested in advice you may have for other institutions that might want to take an intentional approach to advancing civil discourse around challenging topics. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for the recognition for our Fair Heat Award, um, which I'm proud to say we have received each year that I've, I've been at the university. Um, so the Common Ground Initiative um, was born of the recognition that we have diversity of thought <coughs> on our campuses, and most of us students, faculty, staff actually live somewhat in a filter bubble. We talk about social media filter bubbles, but um, we find ways to keep ourselves among the people who agree with us, even on campus, and don't recognize the diversity of thought frequently that is around us. So there was that recognition, but also the recognition that after the election in 2016, um, I really wanted to get ahead of the um, unrest on campuses, the, the potential protests, the, the challenges, and make diverse perspectives the, a part of the fabric of everything that we do instead of getting in a space where we were screaming at each other and not um, seeing much progress from that. So. Um, I felt that Widener had the potential to be a leader in creating a comfortable and supportive environment that honors free speech and listening to diverse perspectives. And the focus of the Common Ground Initiative is really listening to people who have different perspectives from you and bringing people together so that they have to listen because they otherwise segregate themselves with people who have the same perspectives. Um, we also um, recognize that, that while our students bring diverse perspectives, um, this is a challenge for our faculty. The faculty want to honor students' perspectives and understand them, but they don't want their perspectives to hijack their classes. So one of the challenges that we talk about in the Common Ground Initiative is if you're teaching a biology class, but something comes up that is political or that or, you know, arouses diverse perspectives, how do you handle that? 
you don't you, you still have to teach biology, but you also feel as a professor that you don't want to ignore the reality of this teachable moment or, or opportunity to to listen to each other. So um, we talk about how we create spaces on campus to have those kinds of conversations and to help faculty feel comfortable dealing with difficult topics when they arise in the classroom. Um, we, we're, now, we're now talking about hate speech and, 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 and violence that comes from hate. In, and how do we talk about that in our offices and our classrooms in a way that's respectful of everyone who's in those spaces um, and one of the things that we've done with Common Ground is really turn to our campus experts. So a lot of times when we start things at campuses, we, for, we look outside for experts or other people, or we, we don't realize, we don't look to our faculty and say, we've got people who have expertise in facilitating these difficult conversations. We have people who have expertise in transforming hatred into productive work and conversations. And so we've really tried to bring our faculty as experts into this work to think about how we um, help people find common ground. Um, we kicked the project off at the National Constitution Center with the CEO of the National Constitution Center. And our law dean, um, Rod Smola, who is a national expert in constitutional law and was called to serve as an expert in Charlottesville after um, the um, problems at UVA. So we talked a lot about, you know, it's okay to have time, place, and manner restrictions, but we shouldn't be afraid of dialogue, and we need to make space for that kind of dialogue. And I think as a leader, I would say it's important to have the courage to jump into those conversations and address those challenging topics rather than ignoring them, because otherwise, they're going to be happening on campus. Um, but they'll be happening without facilitation that helps people grow from that. That's great, thank you. And just to make the logic of this session transparent, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists a question specific to their institution because there are so many important and challenging things that we're trying to deal with as leaders in higher education right now. And then we'll move into discussion of a few common areas. So, President Jordan. When you were enrolled in our, in our executive doctorate program, you were the vice president for student affairs at LaGuardia Community College. You were. And now you've served as president of Tarrant County College South since 2012. As chair of your dissertation committee, I'm especially <laughs> proud of you. One of the initiatives that you're the champion of at Tarrant County College is the Integrated Student Success Model. Can you tell us some about this initiative? What are the issues you're trying to address? What are some uh, emerging promising strategies? What else is on your list to do? Um, so the, quest, the problem with the question is, where do you begin, <laughs> right? Um, but let me give you a little bit of background uh, on Tarrant County College. It is a system, uh, a system with six campuses uh, spread across about um, 800 square uh, miles uh, in North Texas. We have over 100,000 students, uh, and each campus has a president. But the system has a chancellor uh, that we report to. Uh, and so for 50 years now, uh, the college has uh, had these uh, specific campuses with their own culture and doing their own thing. Uh, what we're doing at this point is focusing on uh, trying to make sure that uh, because our students have the opportunity to attend any of the six campuses, that the experiences these students have uh, are pretty much the same wherever they go, whatever campus uh, they're on. Uh, to step back to uh, almost eight years ago now, when I joined Tarrant County College, I really could not get folks to talk about uh, things that were really substantive. I was coming off, fresh off of a a dissertation and new, newly minted EDD and have all of these uh, wonderful stories to tell about research and best practices and so forth, could not 
uh, get conversations going because all people wanted to talk about was uh, broken furniture in classrooms and uh, clutter and limited resources and so forth. Well, it's taken seven years, but we are at a place where uh, faculty are now having conversations about important things like student success and access and so forth. Uh, so what we are talking about relative to uh, this model has to do with uh, how we use institutional resources to help students build capital, build their own capital. Uh, students come to us with different uh, levels of capital, whether it's cognitive or financial or what have you. And we, as a college, want to make sure that we are aligning our resources in ways that uh, help those students connect with resources that help them build capital so that by the time they graduate, they're going into the world uh, much better than when they came to us. So we are shifting paradigms. We are uh, moving from a college where the culture has been built on uh, trying to find college-ready students to having a culture where we, as a college, is striving to be student-ready. So that, in a nutshell, is uh, the gist of uh, the work that we're doing towards this model. Uh, we're in the formative stages of it. And uh, I, I'm really excited about the possibilities. That's great, thank you. So President Charles <coughs> is the sixth president of the Community College of Philadelphia. Community College of Philadelphia is the only community college in Philadelphia. One pillar of your strategic plan is workforce development, readiness, and economic innovation. So how and why is CCP important to Philadelphia's workforce and economic in innovation? I'm sure there are lots of different examples, but can you offer a particularly compelling example of how this plays out? Uh, sure. Let me, let me begin by pointing out the obvious that I'm the only one who did not graduate from the University of Pennsylvania, so hopefully that doesn't put me at a disadvantage here. Yeah, okay, that's good. And, and not only that, but as my colleagues and I sat to, at the table, everybody pulled out pen and paper, and I, I don't have pen and paper, so. Um, I start with the, the premise that, you know, that Philadelphia is, is probably the, the, the poorest, richest, large city in the country. We have a 26% poverty rate in this, in this city which is tragic. And I, tr I have tried from the day that I began at Community College of Philadelphia to make the connection between what we do and the needs and interests of this city in the context of social justice, because most of the students we, we provide educational opportunities for, it is about opportunity and access. So I think it's incredibly important for us to not forget that. It's very easy to get tied up into the, you know, the, the, you know, the aspects of higher education that forget what higher education is really about. Um, the workforce development initiatives that we took on was directly tied to the idea that there is this 26% poverty rate in the city of Philadelphia and there is a need to align the community colleges um, services and purpose and educational um, strategies to the needs of the business community, the needs of the communities, the students that we serve, um, and the interests of the city. And so we bega began by expanding um, the workforce development and economic initiatives division of the college. We, we did not have it. We were a very traditional transfer institution. The transfer function is still strong, and that's not to say that workforce development is at the exclusion of that. I tried to make the case that the two are intertwined in many ways. I mean, if your interest is to provide good citizenship, which is what higher ed is about, then you can't lose fact of the fact uh, that many individuals can come into college, come into the college, college completion, um, provide um, provide um, livable provide themselves with liv livable wages for their for their family and the impact on their communities in the city is, is quite profound so we've made a sizable um, investment in our workforce we created an, an entire division we hired a vice president we've hired staff um, to go out and to establish partnerships and relationships in the areas of contract training corporate um, corporate solutions 
Um, and it's pretty amazing that the questions in many instances which were ne never asked. You know, the, the businesses were out there with a need, but we never really sought, in a, in a large scale way, um, to position ourselves as a major player in this workforce development space. Um, so, you know, that was the easy part. The difficult part is to convince, you know, uh, in many ways, and I'll be careful because one of my colleagues is here, faculty, um, that we're, we're not doing this at, you know, it's the, at the age old um, argument of career technical versus the sort of liberal, liberal humanities transfer function. Um, I think it's a false dichotomy. I've tried to make that case that it is a false dichotomy, that if we're interested in building a better society, we have to find ways to merge the two. And that plays out in the context of how we treat our students. It plays out in the context of how we provide um, what we refer to as competency-based learning. Everything doesn't come in the context of a three credit, 15 hour um, seat time um, structure. Um, it plays in the context, plays out in the context of prior learning experiences. So, you know, there, there's no one answer. You know, one of the current challenges is stackable credentials. I want our students who can come in, you know, many of whom come through our KEYS program. KEYS is an anti-welfare program. And one of the areas, you know, Philadelphia's eds and meds, one of the areas where there's a real large need is on that, the bottom ladder of that, that med. So I want to provide opportunities for those who are not working or have been multiple generations of non-work to come into the workforce through CNA or through, you know, some type of healthcare um, 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 based um, profession but be able to get on a ladder to go into nursing eventually. So stackable credentials is one of the areas that we're, that's playing out as we speak. A good example is phlebotomy. That's an area that students can have a rel very relatively short term training, they can get a job in that field. But for me to do that, I have to negotiate with my nursing faculty and the, <laughs> the clinical sites around the city to provide them with enough sticks so that they can get the credentials. So making the case that this is a viable type of higher educational experience for our students. That's just one example. That's, that's part of the continued challenge um, that I've been trying to make. And, th and then, you know, finally I'll say, you know, you mentioned one pillar, but I think they're all inter inter interrelated. Um, I take serious the idea of student success. We can't just give platitudes that we do wonderful things. You know, Haseem Hardiman, many of you may have heard, he came to community college, he's now a Rhodes Scholar. But for every Haseem Hardiman, there's thousands of students that never make it, that drop out. So we need to look at the numbers. We need to quantify what we're doing, not just in graduation rates, but how many students are coming through our developmental ed courses, how many are making through it, and what are we doing to provide an engaging experience through those developmental um, courses? Because you know the, the great secret of higher ed is that's a black hole. 60% of all the students that come to higher ed go into developmental ed. So what can we do to transform in, in a way that is engaging that is enlightening for them, that it creates a pathway. We are a pathways institution. You, you gave me a loaded question, so I can go on and on. But we are a pathway institution. We want our students to be on these pathways through these engaging developmental and ESL structures that we put in place that will lead them towards a career pathway. Many will go in, in, into the trans, one of the transfer degrees. Many will go into our AAS degrees, which is in some instances a transfer, but really is a, a capstone degree. But many will go in through our workforce development, which in some cases are certificate that can lead to credits. Um, you know, it's access, it's opportunity. They can, they, can, um, they can go out into the workforce or they can continue to move their way into a degree program where they can transfer or, and or move into one of our capstones uh, program. If you, if you live in the city of Philadelphia, it's not likely that you've been to a dental office and you haven't had a, a dental technician take care of you. But if you've been to any of the hospitals, that's from the Community College of Philadelphia. If you've been to a hospital in the city of Philadelphia, it's not likely that you've not encountered one of our students. So it's comprehensive. I think placing a larger focus, placing the resources, um, and I'll say this, you know, we are in the process. We have an auto tech, we talked about auto tech. We have an auto tech center. It's about 10,000 square feet, it's a little larger and a little more sophisticated than my garage, <laughs> just to give you an idea. Um, if you go through the south of this country, there are um, auto tech centers that look like space centers. You know, it's a high tech, um, it's, it's, it's artificial intelligence, it's a level of technology that we have to move towards to be a serious player in this workforce development space. So we're moving in West Philly, not too far from here. Um, we do have half the funding for it. We're moving from 10,000 square feet to 40,000 square feet. And so we're putting the resources, we're adding structure, we're restructuring the college, and all of it is really designed to provide opportunities and access so people can get jobs with livable, livable wages. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Provost Bridget, you've been in your role now about 15 months. 
It's been an incredible privilege to observe you as you've taken leadership of what is an incredibly wide-ranging role. Thank you for all you do on behalf of our university and for our school. <laughs> One of the many initiatives that you have advanced is wellness at Penn. So why is wellness a priority? What have you done and what else is on your to-do list? Thank you, Dr. Vernon. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome home. Welcome back to campus. We're really happy to have you uh, here. Um, and thank you for, to my colleagues for participating in this conversation. Uh, I am, first of all, a very proud member of the, the faculty at the School of Education, and I teach in the higher education program, and actually one of my students is president, was President Hubert, uh, so <laughs> congratulations. Um, and I see some other students out there, too. Um, and then, the, before I, I quickly answer the question, I do want to just acknowledge Dr. Pernan and all the work that you do. Um, and you know, this is a particularly busy day uh, for administrators here. Um, but I said yes to participate in the panel. Why? Because whenever I ask Laura to do something, she says yes. Um, and, and so, I uh, wanted to model good behavior. Um, and you know, everything that you do. And I can say a message that I say to students all the time is that uh, students ask for career advice, and I say, say yes a lot. Um, you just never know what's going, to, what's going to happen when you say yes. Um, so, uh, so uh, with the part to your uh, uh, question, and I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, I'll start with saying, uh, so uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Louis Brandeis is uh, known for writing, uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, and actually, I think scientifically that's not true. Um, but, 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 it, but it might have been in the 1910s when he wrote it. Um, and so why do I say that? I'm trying to frame the challenge we have broadly and positively. Um, we are excavating a lot of problems right now in this, on this campus, in this, in this city, in this country, in this world, right? Um, and, and so, but sunlight is a great, if not the best, disinfectant. And so we are now confronting a lot of things. And we are not an isolated place. We are in the middle of a complicated city, as Guy said, in the middle of a complicated state, in the middle of a complicated country, and a complicated world. And so we have students, faculty, and staff who are struggling with everything from the daily anxiety that everybody deals with, but that is heightened in the world that we live in right now, to serious mental health challenges. And then, as a place with 25,000 students, I get nervous every time I say that. Um, and with 40,000 staff, I get nervous every time I say that, we have, we have to confront this. And so, so the answer to your question in one sentence is, until we have a cultural wellness, we actually can't be really productive and successful in all the things that we need to do in research um, and in teaching um, and engaging with our community and, and advancing our institution and our country. So I mean, the reason why we're focused on it is because we can't do anything else until we have, have that culture of wellness. And we've been doing a lot of things, and it really does come from all the way from you know, supporting students with significant mental health challenges to um, developing a web of supports that everybody feels supported on campus and has many touch points, many contacts, many people that they can go to who can understand what their needs are and figure out how to support them. Um, and actually, that includes all of our alums. So it actually includes everybody in this room, uh, whether you're a student, a staff member, or an alum, who I, think, I would hope can help us uh, create that culture of wellness. We do a decent job, but we know we can do a lot more. So, so that's in essence what we're doing. Um, but I want to have more of a conversation. So I think actually, as I, I've listened to my colleagues, you know, I think that one thing that ties, no, the thing, not one thing, the thing that ties together in these comments is if you look at, if you listen, if you were listening, and everybody talked about cultural change. Um, and I think at the core, any any meaningful effort requires cultural change, right? And anything that's really meaningful probably requires dealing with entrenched cultures, which means lots of work to have real cultural change, right? So actually, actually, I think, in my view, that's the theme of this discussion. Um, and, and I look forward to conversation in, in the audience, because all of you, in my mind, are involved in some way in cultural change. Um, the positive thing, I'll end with the positive thing, is that you know, I think, again, we've excavated a lot of issues. That's the start. Um, now we actually have to figure out how to deal with them, and I'm optimistic um, by nature, but also uh, because I interact with lots of wonderful students that we're actually going to solve them. So that's both a short answer to your question and kind of hopefully a little bit of framing of what we're trying to do here, I think. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And so um, one aspect that all of you, I'm sure, is um, trying to think about in your leadership roles has to do with perhaps change, but um, really thinking through the sustainable financial model of your institution. So, you clearly, when you look at the characteristics of your institutions, all highly committed to enrolling a diverse student body, helping to figure out how to help students pay the cost of attendance. This is obviously, as we know, increasingly challenging as the costs continue to go up. 
we could spend hours, days, months, years talking about this topic. But uh, for the purposes of this, having a conversation around these issues and helping us understand how this plays out differently across different institutions, if you could each briefly highlight something that is important to you as you think about this question of a sustainable financial model. Great. Um, you know, it, it goes back to the culture of change. The other thing I've learned being president is that everyone in higher ed does the same thing over and over again that everyone else is doing. Um, and so um, I very early on asked the question, why are we raising tuition 3% next year? And the answer was, well, all of our competitors are raising tuition 3% next year. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, what does that mean in terms of student aid? And it turns out every time we raise 3%, our aid goes up and it's a wash. Um, I was hired because my research was on revenue diversification in higher ed. And so what I'm trying to do is change the conversation. Um, so I've been talking a lot about we're not going to nickel and dime ourselves to prosperity. And the amount of time you turn about movie with people talking about the, the messes and stuff. In higher ed, a lot of people spend weeks on committees talking about $1,000 and try to focus on revenue. Um, and also one thing I learned from my research is that there's no, there's no $5 million answer. There's a lot of $50,000 to $100,000 answers, and we have to try a lot of different things. Um, and so we are trying a lot of different things while the faculty are looking at curriculum. And there's a lot of non-curriculum things that, that you can do, starting with what President Journals was talking about. I come from a business school. Business schools for accreditation have to have corporate relations and external um, outreach. And so we're developing that similar to what you're talking about. But I think the other key thing that President Jordan, we just met today, so we're not doing this on purpose. But you made a very key point that I've been, I've been focusing on at Whittier. So especially in the small college world, um, I saw Diane this morning, we are Division Three athletics. Our athletic facilities are nicer than Penn's and UCLA's. They are beautiful. We have a brand new swimming pool. We have a diving team. We have a brand new football stadium. And I recently met one of the alums who loves athletics, and he said, you need a beach volleyball team. <laughs> and I'm really, and I already talked to the city of Whittier, and they'll sell you the space, but I'm willing to invest in it. So part of the conversation, I've been talking about aligning resources, because particularly in small institutions, there's a, there's a culture of taking money for anything without thinking about, does it align with our mission of student success or the mission of investing in more revenue? And that's very, that's part of why mm -hmm. I represent Tate. It's very difficult for my institution, including people who report to me, to think differently, because they're incented to bring in more money. And I've been saying, why are you why are you pricing an endowed chair at 1.5 million when we're only going to get 55,000 dollars and we have to find other money? Or why are you agreeing to to take the money to make a film, a documentary in Hong Kong that has nothing to do with our academic mission? So I think what, I think what uh, <coughs> Professor or President Jordan said about aligning resources to the mission is probably just as important to the business model as new revenue. So. Uh, so, at Tarrant County College, uh, our revenue sources are three. There's, uh, there are revenues that come from uh, our right to tax residents of Tarrant County. Uh, there's state funding, and there's tuition. We do have some investments, uh, which don't necessarily produce uh, a great deal, but we're in good financial shape. Sixty percent of our revenues come from the taxation of local residents. Uh, Twenty percent uh, come from what well, it used to be. Twenty percent back in 2014 came from the state. This year, that's 17 percent, okay. and. Uh, the contribution of students, student tuition, uh, has been pretty much level over the last five years. So as a college, it's not in our interest to uh, keep raising tuition on students uh, or to keep asking the residents of the county 
uh, to keep uh, footing the major part of the bill. So as an institution and as administrators, uh, we are looking at how can we use resources of the college uh, to help, uh, again, build uh, or enhance the college's capital. So take, for example, uh, our gym or theater. How can we use the gym to create uh, an ongoing enterprise that's like any other fitness center uh, to serve the community, okay? That brings in revenue, but can also provide the opportunity for our students in kinesiology and nutrition uh, to practice and apply what they are learning in the classroom and to uh, use that experience perhaps to land a job as uh, a trainer, personal trainer, or a manager of a gym after graduation. So we are looking closely at how we can use uh, the resources of the college to uh, help business and industry. Also, uh, we talked earlier about uh, working with business and industry. We just joined as a college uh, with Toyota to offer students what is called the T10 program. It's a program that trains students to work on a Lexus and Toyota vehicles. Uh, but with that partnership came a whole <coughs> slew of resources from Toyota, including scholarships to support those students as well. Uh, so we're on the hunt, uh, be careful, uh, looking for uh, partnerships, to develop more partnerships, to get more involved with grant funding and fundraising, which is something that community colleges like ours have not uh, done or felt that uh, we should be doing because we've been relying quite a bit on uh, the state government and our local uh, taxation uh, abilities to, to raise funds. Great, thank you. So, if you're studying community colleges and somewhere in your readings you were told that the funding um, structure is uh, based on this uh, one third, one third, one third, I'm here to tell you that that has never been the case. It is a lie. In my 35 years of history, anyway, it's never been the case. Right now, students pay about, the students are footing about 60% of our, of our total revenue. Um, the state's about 24%, and in the city's about 20 And of course, you know that's subject to the political winds. Um, so um, it's, it, it is a real issue. What can we do to be able to sustain ourselves? So we're looking at a few things. First of all, we think it's important to, to pursue public-private partnerships. Um, we think that that's a way to find both um, sources of revenues and, and or find a way to provide services for, your, for, your, you know, for whatever um, service services your students might need. So it could be childcare services, we engage in a public-private partnership with a developer. We own the land. He developed the building, and now we're able to provide housing for students. Which brings me to the next point. I really think, especially for community colleges, the opportunity for um, international students is something that we should really pursue. I know, I believe Houston has about 5,000 international students. And as you know, they pay three times the rate. They, you know, there is the moral reason because you want to culturally diversify. But you know, for us bean counters, there is a very practical reason for that as well. Um, and they're, they're extremely good students. You know, Philadelphia is a very attractive place around the world that students want to come um, to, to study. So I'm making a bet on the idea that I can sell this notion that do two years at the community college and then transfer to, <laughs> to Penn or Temple or Drexel or, or something like that. So right now, we've got about 300, and that, that number is, is climbing. So that's, that's another source. Um, philanthropy, community colleges have not been in the business of raising money. You know, the, the tradition of the stereotype is, well, you're a public institution, you don't need to raise money. Well, I mean, the presidents, the leaders need to make the case that that is not true. That if you want us to be um, top-notch institutions, state-of-the-art institutions, we need uh, opportunities for private dollars, um, both for capital reasons, but also for student scholarships. Um, as, as you know, we've talked about this, you know, I did a study once where I looked, I wanted to find out how many students had signed up, registered, and ready to go, and dropped out because they couldn't pay. And in the course of one year, it was 3,000 students at Community College of Philadelphia, <coughs> which led to our decision to start our Promise program. So, you know, it, it kills me. We're, 
fighting for every single student, and then I'll come in on a Monday and they tell me we had to drop 400 students because they, you know, they got past the, they couldn't make the payment. Um, so, which brings me to my final point: we need to find ways to keep not only to help students pay tuition, but also to keep them in, in college. Because the bottom line is, we don't get to return on the investment until they get into their second and third year, until they're solid students with, a, you know, with with enough credits under their belt to be successful. Um, the churn, it really, really kills our bottom line. Um, I don't know if there's a, anything magical that's going to um, change it. I think if we can convince you know, some of the really big philanthropists, you know, the, the um, Jeff Bezos of the world to drop a couple of billion, billions with a B on community colleges, that could be the answer, but I don't know that that's coming. Okay. Thank you. So um, let me just start by saying that um, Widener is only about 20 minutes outside of um, Center City, Philadelphia. Um, but we are in the poorest city in the state, Chester. And so a lot of our resources go to helping our city um, develop economically, to helping the, the children of Chester to have opportunities for better education, um, and in K-12, um, as well as college education. And so that's a commitment we make. It's also a great opportunity for our students to have experiential learning and for we have a lot of pro bono clinics in our community where our students are, have opportunities to learn. So um, that's a piece of our financial sustainability is we have to make sure that we're supporting the, the city that we're in as well. I, I will take this um, question from a slightly different perspective. From when I think about financial sustainability, the first thing I think about is where do we invest? How do we make choices about where we invest? Because if we want to grow and succeed, we have to invest. And so we, I believe we need to invest in innovation. <coughs> and for us, that's been, for example, our new robotics, uh, undergraduate robotics engineering major, where we have four times the number of students in the first year as we planned for, which is fantastic. Um, so there's a real interest in that kind of interdisciplinary program and in the interdisciplinary research we're doing, most of which relates to um, healthcare and um, engineering, healthcare, the sciences really working together. The other place I think we really have to invest is in talent, and that's faculty and staff. Um, that's what keeps our institution um, not just um, sustainable, but thriving, and draws people to us, and draws grants to us, and draws donors to us. Um, and part of this is just part of our drive to continuously get better. If we're not driven to continuously get better, we're not going to be sustainable financially. We have diversified revenue streams that's been brought up already. One of the great things about Widener is we're half undergraduate, we're half graduate. So as you know, as the economy changes, people go back to school or don't go back to school, they go to graduate school, they don't go to graduate school. Um, our uh, demographics in this region, uh, we're gonna drop our traditional age uh, high school graduates by 15% over the next 10 years. Um, so graduate programs are where our growth is going to be. Um, so we, and we do serve traditional undergraduate students primarily in our undergraduate programs. Um, quite different from some of the, of the community colleges. We do have programs for adults, but they are a much smaller piece of what we do. Um, our graduate programs, we're very strong in um, healthcare and related fields, um, whether it's master's, PhD in nursing, physical therapy, clinical psychology, but we also have two law schools, which is highly unusual. Um, One's in Harrisburg, one's in Wilmington, Delaware. So we have diversified revenue streams. It's very important to keep all of those pieces strong. Um, and then I'm really an advocate of business process improvement. And I believe that that is a way to reduce expenses without cutting. So people talk about cuts in budgets and making cuts. We don't want to cut things that are important. We want to find more efficient and better ways to do them that actually make them better, but cost less. And those align very closely with a lot of our goals. For example, sustainability. We found ways to reduce expenses and advance our sustainability goals um, at the same time. So to me, that's where I focus when I think about financial sustainability, investment, business process improvement, diversified revenue streams, 
and thrive to continuously get better. So Dr. Perna consciously put together a diverse panel in lots of ways, including the diversity of the institutions. And let's start and end with the fact that we're an extremely wealthy institution. We are. Uh, we're, but we're blessed. Um, and we have many, many times the resources that my colleagues have now. What that means to the President Gutman and me is that it's even more our moral responsibility to share our wealth. And so a lot of that's why President Gutman has been focused in particular on increasing the number of first generation low income students on campus. Um, that's why we've announced a lot of different initiatives in the last couple of years. It's why we're celebrating the fact that we've now raised over a billion dollars uh, for financial aid for low income students. And so, so that's just the fact that we are a much more wealthy institution. And it's, why I think our obligation is even stronger. Full stop. Um, so, but, 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 actually, as I think about the answer to the question, the things that we're doing are exactly the same things that my colleagues are doing. Um, trying to set priorities, um, trying, trying to be efficient in the use of our resources, um, and trying to develop new initiatives. Um, and so, you know, what's different about us is that we have a lot of priorities. But, you know, I'll come back to what I said earlier about Laura. Um, my job is actually to say no all the time. Um, um, because, you know, we, we can do these 20 things or these 50 things, but we can't do these other 200 things. Um, and so I do say no on a daily basis to things that are priorities because we just can't do everything. Even an institution as wealthy as ours can't do everything. Um, so that's one. Two, we're all constantly looking for efficiencies also. Um, and three, we're always looking for new programs that will support our um, uh, strengths and, and help improve society. And so just yesterday, um, we, the trustees approved new, two new degree programs. Uh, one is a master's in genetic counseling, um, and another one is a master's in bioinformation, bioinformatics, sorry. Um, and there are things that will build on the strengths of our school of medicine and also are actually also about our, our relating to the economy because our institution and others are hiring more genetic counselors and bioinformaticians and so we're doing actually the same exact things as, as my colleagues are, are doing. Um, and then one other point, which I'll raise just because even though I know my colleagues are doing it, um, they didn't raise this, we've been focused on expanding our efforts in online education. Um, and in the last six months, we announced two new degree programs, one at the undergraduate level, a Bachelor of Arts in Applied Sciences, which will mostly be at the, at, on, up online, um, and then a Master of Computer Information Technology from the School of Engineering, um, which will be fully online, and we're doing it in partnership with Coursera. We that that should be very successful. We've gotten a lot of applications already. So again, in, in the end, we're, we do, we're doing the same things, um, just at different scales. That's great. So I want to come back to this issue of creating a cultural change and the role of leadership. So clearly addressing these challenging problems create, it requires excellent leadership. So thank you all for the leadership you're providing. So although you wouldn't know it from the composition of our panel, our nation's higher education leaders are not as diverse as our nation's students. So just a couple statistics. One report from the Council on Independent Colleges found that the average private college president was married, white, male, and average age of 61. The Pew Research Center says only 30% of college and university faculty are women. So today we have many future higher education, current and future higher education leaders. What advice do you have for those who aspire to be college presidents and provosts? And is there anything in particular you would say to the women and people of color who are here? And I think we should start. Well, I can be quick because I actually already said it, say yes to a lot of things. Um, I mean, that's how, that's how my path has been. I mean, I didn't envision being a provost. I didn't envision being a chancellor of Rutgers Camden before that. Um, I did, in my 20s, envision being an academic, and I've loved, and I still love being an academic, and sometimes frustrated that I actually don't do a lot of being an academic. Um, but, but in terms of the administrative roles I've had, they all came because of connections that I had made in my previous roles. Um, so again, say yes to a lot of things. You just never know where saying yes is going to take you. I, I, I think these things are difficult to map out. So often young people do tell me is that I'd like to be a university provost and I'd like to be a president. And I say, I respect that. Um, I'm not really sure you can map it out that way. You can map out, again, doing good work and being open to opportunities. Um, and wanting to be ambitious and advance in your career, but I'm not sure you can really map this out. Mm -hmm. Great. So I would say the same. The first thing I say is, you know, be open to opportunity and um, don't 
be afraid to take risks when, when opportunities come your way. Um, I'm often asked to by very young people, college students, I want to be a president someday, how do I get there? It's not, there's no pathway. <laughs> um, but be open to opportunity, believe in yourself, um, and, and recognize that everyone, or everyone who's not narcissistic perhaps, suffers from imposter syndrome at times. Um, so, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be certain that you're ready or that you're, you know, you belong there um, in order to, um, to take risks and, and take opportunities. But don't lose your humility along the way. Um, and, you know, I would say the biggest, the biggest, the greatest advice I would have for you is work really hard. People will recognize that and that will bring opportunities your way. Um, and then figure out what you believe, what you stand for, what's important to you, and be courageous about standing for that in, in everything that you do. Of course, I would echo everything that was just said. There is no playbook. Um, you know, there are a lot of institutes for presidential leadership and leadership institutes, and they'll tell you some things, and you know, it's good information, but put it in the back, and, and just you have to live your life in an institution that you're in. Um, I think you're absolutely well, you're absolutely right. Saying yes to a lot of things, and saying yes to things that you're not necessarily going to get paid for. You probably won't get paid for. Um, I can't tell you how many times someone comes to me and says, "Well, I got my doctorate degree, and I show up every day. How come I'm not getting promoted?" It doesn't work that way. You have to be an engaged citizen in the institutions that you're in, and make your place, make your mark. And I think. At least in my, this, this is my fifth, fifth, fifth stop. Every place I've been, I've made progressive progress. Not that it was you know, a conscious thought to be a college president someday. It just happened naturally because I love what I do. That's the other thing. If you don't love it, if you just want to be a college president, you don't love yeah. students and faculty <laughs> and education, <laughs> find somewhere else to be a president. You won't work here. So you have to love it. You have to love coming to work every day. You have to go show up to basketball games, show up to student, student activity events, and. You know, even now, I do a lot of that stuff. And um, I think that's all part of it. You're, you're a part of the, the community. And you will get recognized for your hard work and your leadership. You know, you have to read, you have to be on top of things. And I think all of that comes together over many years. I mean, there are some who hit it very young. But for most of us, it happens over many years. So three things. One, uh, I would say think systemically, meaning uh, get outside of your bubble. The job that you're doing is connected to a whole lot of other stuff. Make sure you understand it. Second, uh, be a team player. Uh, we're all independent thinkers and actors. Uh, we know how to do that well, uh, but learn how to play with others. Uh, and the third piece is that you need to be ready. So being in this program, uh, pursuing uh, continuing education is going to be critical because when that call comes, whether it's for you to uh, be in an acting or interim role or someone nominates you for a position they think you would be good for, be ready. And I'm going to take something that Provost Pritchett said and turn it around when he said, um, he says no, don't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, 20 years ago, I was, I was running a startup and taking it public. Um, Let's see, about seven years ago, without a doctorate, I was made dean of one of the largest business schools in the United States. Two years ago, I was working on my dissertation here in the exact doc program and started to get calls from recruiters. Um, and a year ago, um, through March, I was in three presidential searches and two business dean searches. Uh, and had heard no from several, but I didn't take no for an answer. And then, and the comments were, "But you're not X, or you don't have a doctorate, or you're not." So don't take no for an answer. Just keep being persistent, 
And um, you know, think of what your, I'm sorry, I'm a business person, think of what your answer is when someone is, you can't because. So I have the five things I always say and did throughout the entire interview process. And people say, well, you can't because. So don't take no for an answer. Sorry. <laughs> Advice that people take in this campus all <laughs> So we're just about out of time. I want to ask two quick questions, so like a lightning round, just to um, build on these last comments and help folks get to know you a little bit better. So, what's one thing about you that's not in your professional bio? Anyone? I make the best gumbo in the world. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend, author of two books. Yeah. I play the drums. <laughs> I have an incredibly supportive husband who understands that my job is deeply important to me. I love my work and puts up with that and also knows periodically that he has to make me take a few minutes away from that and do something else now and then. So I have two daughters in college. Neither of them are here. Um, but so I live this 24/7. <laughs> well, and uh, so then just building on some of what you just said, what do you do to take care of your own mental health and well-being? I post, post, uh, from the fundamentals. Have to mention my wife, who's sitting too. <laughs> profession and you know we have mid Friday nights are reserved for you know dinner and wine and just talking about the week and issues that we both deal with I mean on different levels but we, we're both dealing with not in a negative way but in a positive way we, as a reminder of how much we both love the work runners, so that helps too yeah. So that would be my, um, I work out every day, and that's absolutely essential Essential to me. It's non-negotiable. I have to do it. <laughs> I do too. I also love tennis, which I don't get to play as much as I used to, but I make a point to at least try at least once, once in that first week. Okay. I make a point of working out at least twice or three times a week. Uh, I also love to travel and try new things to <coughs> pretend I'm getting younger. Uh, <laughs> so recently I started uh, to learn how to horse back right. Wow. Uh, wow. Of course, wow. uh, um, in Texas. Yeah. So. <laughs> junkie but I read everything and the other thing is I did not realize how important it was for me personally to take a job in my hometown that I haven't lived in for 20 years where my sons are and my parents and my sisters um, and so that is so key because being the president is very lonely or Dean and so that has meant more to me the last four months is that I'm back home with my family and my sons. I'm going to be a grandmother in December, so that's part of it. This has been so fun. I can stand. I could ask you questions all day, but thank you for participating in this conversation.